Um, Father Simon uh, asked me uh, some months ago um, if for the conference I would be willing to address the subject of death. Death. Uh, I know it's entirely by accident that I happen to be the oldest friar preacher at the Angelicum. So here I am being afforded, it's clear, the opportunity as an aging friar to contemplate the challenging and potentially imminent, how else to say it, potentially imminent reality of death. Thank you, Father Simon, for that. <laughs> On a serious note, I, I, I am, of course, delighted, honored to be part of this particular uh, conference. Looking death straight in the eye, the wisdom and witness of the saints. At the Basilica of San Clemente here in Rome, the tomb which lies directly under the high altar contains, according to received tradition, the relics of both Saint Clement of Rome and Saint Ignatius of Antioch. Elsewhere in the San Clemente complex, there is another tomb or sarcophagus unknown to the public whose original place may well have been in the atrium of the Basilica. It now finds its place in the garden of the Irish Dominican Collegio adjoining the Basilica. This tomb, an ancient Roman sarcophagus of grey marble, was reused in medieval times around the year 1300 in order to house the remains of a certain Niccolo Bonsignore. Niccolo, a lawyer by profession, belonged to a prominent Sienese family which in the late 13th century were bankers to the papacy. Why have I chosen to make reference to this particular tomb is because inscribed across its front in bold letters is an unusually striking statement concerning death. Niccolo, who was, we are told in the inscription, distinguished during his life by the glory of his knowledge of the law, now speaks from the tomb, as it were, stripped of all prestige and glory, his haunting ghostly words, a warning to all those coming after him of the vanity of earthly endeavor. Recognize in me, you who read this, how limited are the possibilities of mankind. As I was what you are, I was lord of my poss poss possibilities. Now I am no more because I am dust and bones. So will you too no longer be the master of your own potential when you will be interred. The fame of the world, honours, prominent position, rank and influence, nobility, strength, pleasure, celebrity, delights and laments, high birth and wisdom, vigour, boldness and intimidation, bruised pride, illness, everything passes except for the love of God. Finally, I was abandoned to wretched death. Then, according to the will of Christ, I was shut up in this grave. Naked was enough for me who once could not do without a big house, a wide bed, fine clothes and tableware. Without a bed, I am laid naked in this marble tomb. I have no pillow, sheets, mattress or linen. I have no overgarment, not even an undershirt. To die is the destiny of all. Death admits no respect for honour. It spares neither the greatest nor the smallest. There are three things which you should know in order to live correctly, be thankful for death, pious and disdainful of worldly goods. Few texts written in the Christian era, or indeed in any area, <clears throat> evoke with such compelling force the sharp, devastating impact of death, the utter and complete loss of so many treasured earthly goods and pleasures, earthly honours, powers and privileges. But the statement itself, although composed in the Christian era, and by a Christian believer, is it in any real sense Christian in spirit? Yes, we do hear sounded, it's true, a few notes of Christian piety. But these are decidedly faint and seem almost to lack conviction. What we don't hear sounded anywhere in the text is the clear note of Christian hope. Although the sarcophagus has obviously been made to serve as a Christian tomb, there survives in the statement of Niccolo an almost pagan perspective on death, a grim and unhappy sense of doom 
a stark melancholy. Pagan stone, pagan marble, entomb the Christian voice. But what is it, we need to ask, that constitutes an authentic Christian understanding of death? My aim in the present talk is, while offering a few general comments on the issue, to explore in some detail how, over the centuries, death has been viewed and approached by the Christian saints. Three sections comprise the work. First, facing death, the distinctive Christian vision. Second, scandal or blessing, Christian grief in the face of death. Third, imagining the unimaginable visions of the afterlife. Facing death, the distinct, distinctive Christian vision. Four centuries before Christ, around the year 441 BC, the Greek chorus in one of the plays by Sophocles named death as the one reality that finally defeats human beings and for which there is no answer. Seconds before that declaration, the chorus had sung with pride of the astonishing technological progress achieved so far by human beings. How humanity had managed to tame and master the natural world with the varied sciences and arts of agriculture, sailing, hunting, city building, language and law. The passage from Sophocles, translated brilliantly by Robert Fitzgerald, is memorable even in translation. We read, Numberless are the world's wonders, but none more wonderful than man. The storm grey sea yields to his plough, the huge crests bear him high. Earth, holy and inexhaustible, is graven with shining furrows where his ploughs have gone. Year after year, the timeless labour of stallions, the light-boned birds and beasts that cling to cover, the lithe fish lightening their reaches of dim water, all are taken, tamed in the net of his mind. The lion on the hill, the wild horse windy-maned, resigned to him, and his blunt yoke has broken the sultry shoulders of the mountain bull. Words also, and thought, as rapid as air, he fashions to his good use. Statecraft is his, and the skill that deflects the arrows of snow, the spears of winter rain. From every wind he has made himself secure, from all but one. Yes, indeed, numberless are the ways we can say which have been devised to help us flee from all that would defeat us as human beings. Clever, enlightened methods, for example, to remove the threat of baffling maladies and diseases. But from one thing in the end, the chorus declares we are unable to flee. Not one single person of our race, no human being, has ever escaped from the late wind of death. Viewed in the light of these declarations, what Christianity proclaims is truly remarkable, namely that there is, in fact, a cure for death, and that the cure is nothing other than the grace and power of Christ Jesus. Words, statements made by Christ regarding death in St John's Gospel are uniquely powerful, indeed astounding in the hope they offer humanity. I am the resurrection and the life, Christ declares. Whoever believes in me will live, even though he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Will never die. That saving truth, the fact that for believers in Christ, natural death is not the end of life, but a door that opens wide into eternity, is a revelation which transformed the lives and transformed the ways of thinking of the early Christians. After death, St. Paul made bold to declare, we will be raised imperishable. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death 
is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? In the first part of the talk this afternoon, my most immediate intention as a way towards a better understanding of the Christian vision of death is to reflect on the witness of three saints, two from the early church and one from modern times, Ignatius of Antioch, Ambrose of Milan, and Therese of Lisieux. A considerable number of saints and martyrs in the early church dared with, with a confidence to match that of St. Paul to look death straight in the eye. But none, I would say, with more courage and more boldness of spirit than Ignatius of Antioch. Some of the letters which Ignatius wrote to the different churches were composed when he was being brought in chains from Syria to be martyred at Rome. The most celebrated of these letters, by far, is the one addressed to the Christians here at Rome. Ignatius regards the threat, um, the threat of martyrdom as a unique opportunity to bear witness to the supreme reality of God. And so he appeals to the Christians in Rome not to intervene to prevent his martyrdom. By staying silent, he declares, and letting me alone, you can turn me into an intelligible utterance of God. But if your affections are only concerned with my poor human life, then I become a meaningless cry once more. Ignatius did not disdain life, far from it. But he is persuaded that the suffering of martyrdom, the anguish it entails, will have an impact on his life like birth pangs and bring to birth such an inner transformation he will become his truest, his most authentic self. He writes, The pines of birth are upon me. Have patience with me, my brothers, and do not shut me out from life. Do not wish me to be stillborn. Here is one who only longs to be God's. Do not make me a present of him to the world again or delude him with the things of earth. Suffer me to attain to light, light, pure and undefiled. For only when I am come thither shall I be truly a man. Leave me to imitate the passion of my God. If any of you has God within himself, let that man understand my longings and feel for me because he will know the forces by which I am constrained. Though Ignatius's gaze is clearly focused on the death that awaits him, his attention is even more focused on Christ, his risen brother and Lord, for whom he wishes to become a libation poured out to God. Instead, therefore, of being overcome by the fear at the thought, the horrendous thought, of being eaten alive by lions in the Colosseum or wherever, Ignatius declares with unspeakable trust and faith, I am his wheat, ground fine by the lion's teeth, to be made purest bread for Christ. This extraordinary statement, this cry of desire in the letter, and other statements like it sent a thrill of wonder throughout the Christian world. What would otherwise have appeared unpalatable from every point of view, a cruel, meaningless and absurd death, was, as a result of Ignatius's trust in the power and grace of Christ, transformed into a wholly unexpected kind of aid and sustenance, a bread of hope and meaning. I am his wheat, ground fine by the lion's teeth, to be made purest bread for Christ. It's almost impossible to exaggerate the impact made on the early church by the death of martyrs such as Ignatius. Writing a few centuries later, St. Ambrose of Milan declares, By the death of martyrs, religion has been defended, faith increased, the church strengthened, the dead have conquered. The persecutors have been overcome. The actual theme of death is one to which Ambrose devoted a huge amount of attention. In fact, of all the Western fathers of the church, no one more than Ambrose, I would say, explores the theme of death with such decided focus and intensity. In the great bishop's understanding 
The sacrificial death of Christ on Calvary changed everything. In virtue of that one sacrifice, death has acquired, Ambrose believes, a completely new meaning. He writes, When we offer the sacrifice, we declare his death, for his death is victory, his death is our mystery, his death is the yearly recurring solemnity of the world. What now should we say concerning his death, since we prove by this divine example that death alone found immortality, and that death itself redeemed itself? Death, then, is not to be mourned over, for it is the cause of salvation for all. Death is not to be shunned, for the Son of God did not think it unworthy of him, and did not shun it. Far from avoiding, therefore, the thought of death, Ambrose suggests that we should actually strive to embrace it. We should, in fact, have nothing less than a daily familiarity with death. Death is not something to be feared, he declares. In his final treatise on the subject, Ambrose, before his own death, in the treatise De Bono Mortis, writes, The Apostle Paul teaches us that we must embrace Christ's death while we are still alive in this world, so that the splendor of his death may shine out in our body. This is the death that leads to happiness. Later in the same treatise, Ambrose writes, Death, in this sense, is a pilgrimage, a lifetime's pilgrimage which none must shirk, a pilgrimage from decay to imperishable life, from mortality to immortality, from anxiety to unruffled calm. Do not be afraid of the word death. Rather, rejoice in the blessings which follow a happy death. What is death, after all, but the burial of vice, the flowering of goodness? Hence the words of Scripture, Let my soul die in the souls of the just, that is, let it be buried with them, and so slough off its own vice, and be clothed in the grace of the saints who carry around the mortification of Christ in their own bodies and souls. What Ambrose is referring there at the end to is, of course, the ordinary, hallowed practice of Christian asceticism. And it's clear from what he's saying that a living and necessary part of that practice involves at every stage of our lives as believers looking death straight in the eye. St. Therese of Lisieux, in the last months of her life, remarked to one of her sisters, I fear I have been afraid of death. By any ordinary standards, the statement is in no way unusual. But coming directly after declarations from St. Ambrose, such as, death is not an object of dread, and there is nothing for us to fear in death, Therese's confession of fear invites reflection. Perhaps the most important thing to note is that Christ himself, having assumed the human condition in its totality, Christ experienced dread before his own death in the Garden of Gethsemane. As human beings, we all naturally abhor the process of dying, even though, as believers in Christ, we trust that after death, we will more than ever be united with God. That mystical hope can coexist with a natural fear of death. This statement, that last statement, was made in a document on death produced in 1992 by the International Theological Commission. The document goes on also to point out that the coexistence of these two states is a phenomenon which appears again and again in the spiritual tradition of the Church, especially among the saints. Dying, for most of us, will very possibly, even probably, be a bewildering, messy affair. But that shouldn't rob the average believer of the strong, wondrous, mystical hope of communion with God, so powerfully expressed by both Ignatius of Antioch and Ambrose of Milan. That hope, in the case of St. Therese, would prove to be unconquerable. 
Not for a second, however, does Therese ignore or deny the fierce anguish and humiliation of the dying process. What would become of me, she exclaims at one point, if God did not give me courage? And she adds, a person does not know what this is unless he experiences it. Yes, what a grace it is to have faith. If I had not had any faith, I would have inflicted death on myself without hesitating a moment. During the final weeks of her life, um, a number of conversations between Therese and some of her sisters were written down. One of them was on the subject of fear and death. Mother Agnes, are you afraid now that death is so close? Therese, ah, less and less. Mother Agnes, do you not fear the thief? This time he is at the door. Therese, no, he is not at the door. He has entered. But what are you saying? How can I fear one whom I love? At this point, it's clear Therese was no longer afraid of death. She was looking at it straight in the eye with enormous hope and trust in God's love. She died on the 30th of September, 1897. Earlier that year, she made a number of sharp, memorable comments on the process of dying. First, in the month of June, she remarked, Don't be troubled, sisters, if I suffer very much. And if you see in me no signs of happiness at the moment of death, our Lord really died as a victim of love. And you see what his agony was? In similar vein, in the month of July, she remarked, Our Lord died on the cross in anguish, and yet his was the most beautiful death of love. And then she adds, To die of love does not mean to die of transports. Sister Nirmala um, told me that she had been uh, present when Mother Teresa died. And uh, it was not a pretty death. <laughs> Mother could no longer breathe. And at the very end, uh, Nirmala said she was looking to me with almost exasperation, as if, do something, as if to say, with her gaze, do something. Of course, um, I suppose that's how Jesus died. <laughs> and, um, but <clears throat> I think, therefore, Teresa's words about all of this are very um, instructive and uh, helpful. Towards the end, Therese herself underwent unbelievable agony. Oh, it's pure suffering, she exclaimed on the 30th of September, because there are no consolations. No, no, not one. Yes, my God, everything that you will, but have pity on me. I can't take any more. I can't take any more. And yet, I, mu I must endure. Tomorrow, it will be worse. And then she remarks, astonishingly, well, so much the better. At the very end, a death rattle tore her chest for more than two hours. It was becoming, Mother Agnes reports, more than ever difficult for her to, be, to breathe. But at the very end, Therese, gazing down at her crucifix, pronounced very distinctly, oh, I love him. Then, moments later, my God, I love you. She looked up to a spot just <clears throat> above the statue of the Blessed Virgin. She appeared to be in an ecstasy that lasted for the space of a cradle. Then finally she closed her eyes and died. Two weeks later, Therese, commenting on the sorry state of her health, had remarked, Yes, I'm like a tired and harassed traveller who reaches the end of his journey and falls over. Yes, but... I'll be falling into God's arms. Scandal or blessing, Christian grief in the face of death. Should Christian believers be grief-stricken at the death of the people they most treasure, most love? Or should they, relying on faith, 
be more joyful than sad, taking comfort in the knowledge that death opens the door into eternity and that a life much greater than the present life has begun. Here is what St. Ambrose of Milan wrote on the subject of death and grief, words of great conviction. But reading his words today, hearing them here this afternoon, do we find, if we're honest, that the message is one to which we can give complete assent? Ambrose writes, We deem that death is not to be mourned over. Firstly, because it is common and due to all. Next, because it frees us from the miseries of this life. And lastly, because when in the likeness of sleep we are at rest from the toils of this world, a more lively vigour is shed upon us. What grief is there which the grace of the resurrection does not console? What sorrow is not excluded by the belief that nothing perishes in death? Nay, indeed, that by the hastening of death it comes to pass that much is preserved from perishing. Two other doctors of the church, St. John Chrysostom of the 4th century and St. Bernard of Clairvaux of the 12th, have reflected memorably on the subject of Christian grief. Limitation of time compels me to limit my consideration uh, of the topic to one sermon by Chrysostom on the consolation of death and one sermon by Bernard, sermon 26 in his commentary on the Song of Songs. What is immediately striking is that on the subject of death, these two great doctors, although they seem at the beginning to aspire to the same ideal, in the end appear radically to disagree with one another. How are we to understand this seeming difference in their two approaches? Chrysostom begins um, his sermon speaking of the sorrow of King David in the second book of Samuel. The king is sad, Chrysostom notes, because he sees his beloved son, whom he loved, as his own soul, lying ill. Dressed in sackcloth, David fasts for seven days, pleading with God to let his son live. But in the end, the boy dies. What happens then is surprising. According to Chrysostom, David immediately rises from the ground, lays down his sackcloth, and is as joyful as if he had received the news that his son had been made well. His friends cannot understand this behavior and ask him, why is he not overwhelmed with sorrow at the death of his beloved son? David replies, when my son was still alive, I humbled myself and fasted and was sad before the face of the Lord. But there was still the hope of receiving a longer life for my son. But after the will of the Lord had been done, it would be foolish and an insult to God if, if I myself still weighed down the heart with unnecessary sorrow. St. John Chrysostom, commenting on this response of David to his son's death, remarks in his homily, Behold, what an example of greatness and virtue! David, who is still under the law, nevertheless had so much control over his grief that he kept his grief in check. Then, turning to address his Christian congregation, Chrysostom, scolding them, exclaims, what, With what kind of neck do we, who live under grace, who have the sure hope of the resurrection, who are forbidden to mourn, with what kind of neck do we weep for our dead like the pagans, raising unrestrained howls? And why do we wear black garments at this time, as if we wanted to show not only by our lamentations, but also by our garments, that we are indeed wretched unbelievers. St. Bernard of Clairvaux's sermon also opens with a reflection on a text from the Old Testament. But in this case, it's a text, a verse from chapter 1 of the Song of Songs. Some days earlier, Bernard's beloved brother, Jared, had died. An actual blood brother to Bernard, Jared was also one of his monks. Jared was a practical man and over the years had proved to be of invaluable help to Bernard. Also, he was greatly loved by the community and by the poor. When he died, many monks, were told, wept for him. Bernard alone did not weep, being determined as abbot, in spite of the strength of his feelings, to manifest a firm faith in the reality of eternal life 
and in that way offer good example to his monks. But in his sermon, Bernard has scarcely managed to share a reflection or two on the text of the Song of Songs, when the feelings which he had suppressed up to now suddenly erupted. How, shall, how long shall I keep my pretense while a hidden fire burns my sad heart, consumes me from within? A concealed fire creeps forward with full play. It rages more fiercely. Then there occurs a veritable explosion of emotion. I, whose life is bitterness, what have I to do with this canticle? Quid mihi et canticle huic? I have done violence to myself and kept up a pretense lest my affection should seem stronger than my faith. While others wept, I, as you could not but see, followed with dry eyes at the graveside till the last solemn rite was performed. The eyes that beheld me were filled with tears and the wonder was that I did not weep since all took pity at seeing me there living on without my Jared. With all the force of faith that I could muster, I resisted my feelings, striving against my will. But the sorrow that I suppressed struck deeper roots within, growing all the more bitter, because it found no outlet. I confess I'm beaten. In every emergency, I look to Jared for help, as I always did, but he is not there. It is Jared whom I weep for. Jared is the reason for my weeping, my brother by blood, but closer by an intimate spiritual bond, the one who shared all my plans. My very heart is torn from me, and shall it be said to me, try not to feel it? But I do feel it intensely, in spite of myself. I have made public the depth of my affliction. I make no attempt to deny it. Will you say then that this is carnal? That it's human, yes, since I am a man. But if this does not satisfy you, then I'm carnal. I am certainly not insensible to pain. To think that I shall die, that those who are mine shall die, will die, fills me with dread. And Jared was mine, so utterly mine. It is he who has gone from me. I feel it. The wound is deep. At this point, the memory of how Jared actually died, the moment of Jared's death, is recalled by Bernard, and he is moved at once to address the spirit of his brother. In the middle of your last night on earth, to the astonishment of those about you, you burst into that hymn of David, let heaven praise the Lord, praise him in the heights. Even then for you, dear brother, the midnight dark was yielding to the dawn, the night was going bright like the day. O oh, Jared, though my mourning is not for you, it is because of you. My deepest wound is in the ardor of my love for you. And let no one embarrass me by telling me I am wrong in yielding to this feeling. The fact that Christ himself was stricken with grief comes to burn his mind all of a sudden, and it serves at once as a source of encouragement. At the tomb of Lazarus, he writes, or he says, Jer Christ neither rebuked to those who wept nor forbade them to weep. Rather, he wept with those who wept. Scripture says, and Jesus wept. These tears were witness to his human kindness. This is Bernard speaking. These tears were witness to his human kindness, not signs that he lacked trust. In the same way, our weeping is not a sign of a lack of faith. It indicates the human condition. Bernard then turns and addresses God directly with these words. You gave me Jared. You took him away. And if his removal makes me sad, I do not forget that he was given to me and I and offer thanks for my good fortune in having had him. The response of Bernard of Clairvaux to the death of his brother, I find not only profoundly moving as a human testament to grief, 
but also exemplary in its Christian witness. What immediately strikes the contemporary reader who happens for the first time upon this particular sermon is that the things Bernard says about the importance of not suppressing the deep and raw feelings of human grief prefigure in quite stunning ways things which have been explored and established or re-established more recently by modern depth psychology. That being said, what judgment can we make about the Sermon of Chrysostom? Its core message, its insistence on the suppression of heartfelt feelings of grief, is it a message so lacking in human understanding, a message so harsh and inhuman in its judgment as to be positively dangerous? I suspect the majority of most or many readers today would probably come to that conclusion. I confess I lean in that direction. The extremism of Chrysostom's language should not, however, blind us to something of enormous importance which the golden-tongued doctor is here urgently trying to express. A belief, a conviction that death has indeed been conquered and that our hope, therefore, is great for all those who have died those whom we have loved and treasured greatly in this life. Though Chrysostom clearly pushes to an extreme the point he wants to make, the faith vision behind his words is a noble and redemptive vision. Chrysostom, as preacher, wants believers never to forget, even when oppressed and beset by grief, that to a sad, death-haunted world, to the pagan world of his time, Christ brought final freedom from the thrall of death. As for Bernard's homily, what I find truly impressive is that far from speaking in the unhappy mode of an unbeliever and grieving, therefore, as if death marked the end of human life, the saint of Clairvaux, in spite of his enormous sorrow, clearly believes that his brother has entered into a realm of wondrous light and joy. That explains why Bernard can exclaim to the brother whom he has lost, would that one day, however far off, I may follow you wherever you go, adding, one cannot doubt but that you have gone to those whom you invited to sing God's praise in the middle of your last night on earth. At this point, Bernard recalls, I was summoned to witness this miracle, to see a man, Jared, exulting in the hour of death and mocking its onset. O oh, death, where is your victory? A sting no longer, but a shout of joy. A man dies while he sings, he sings by dying. Bernard then turns and addresses death itself with these strong, radiant words. Jared had no fear of you, shadowy phantom that you are. Jared passes on to his fatherland through your jaws not only secure, but filled with overflowing joy. Imagining the unimaginable, visions of the afterlife. Because the saints and martyrs of the church have a positive vision of what awaits them beyond the grave, they are able not only to look death in the eye, but are able with manifest hope and confidence to look through it as it were. Their confidence based on the one or two images revealed by Christ concerning the afterlife. Heaven, in other words, as a place of many mansions, a place where Christ waits to welcome us. These images are helpful in making concrete the believer's conviction about the world to come. But with regard to heaven itself, we read in the New Testament, eye has not seen nor ear heard the things God has prepared for those who love him. A statement highlighting the near impossibility of describing what heaven will be like for those found worthy to enter into that eternal state of joy. Not surprisingly, questions, challenging questions, arose in the minds of the early Christians concerning the likely experience of that blessed state. What kind of body, for example, will the saints possess in heaven in their new resurrected life? This question St. Paul answered by indicating that our present bodies will have to be undergo a wondrous change. This perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. 
The spiritual body in heaven will still, of course, be a physical body, even though it will be one which transcends the present limitations <clears throat> of space and time. The saints in glory, it's worth noting, are not disembodied angels. On the contrary, they are alive, we can say, in a transfigured state of physicality. So wondrous, so mysterious are the realities of the afterlife, and so challenging for our minds to contemplate, it might seem wise to set all such speculations aside. But that was not the decision made by theologians in the Middle Ages, Aquinas among them. These dogged thinkers, these undaunted contemplatives, made bold to put forward ideas and images suggestive of the form which the body would assume in this glorified state. Here I'm referring, of course, to the four dowries or gifts, dotes in Latin, of the glorified body. Aquinas speaks of these dowries in his commentary on the sentences and again in his commentary on Matthew's Gospel. But what I find particularly worthy of note are the references made to them in the prayer that's attributed to Thomas, Te Deum Totius Consolationis, known in English as prayer for the attainment of heaven. There exists, I'm happy to say, not only internal but also external evidence to suggest that Thomas really was the author of this particular prayer. The first thing uh, Thomas asks in the prayer is that he might possess in heaven an intimate and refined knowledge of God the first truth. But then he goes on at once to ask that the body likewise would be transformed by grace. Give to my body also the splendor of claritas, the promptitude of agilitas, the penetration of subtilitas, and the strength of impassibilitas. The claritas of the transfigured body will mark a clear fulfillment of the promise made in the Book of Wisdom. The virtuous will shine and will run to and fro like sparks among the stubble. And the promise made in Matthew the virtuous will shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Owing to the overflow of grace from the resurrected soul into the body, there will be no strain or labor in the movements of the saints, and newfound agilitas will enable them to travel vast distances at the speed of thought. The third gift, that of subtilitas, refers to a certain ease and subtlety of movement, a lack of density in the body, whereby the body will, while remaining flesh, will acquire such a delicacy of spirit it will be able to pass through every obstacle, even as Christ, after the resurrection, was able to pass through walls of stone. Finally, because of the saints' unchangeable and everlasting enjoyment of God, they will receive the gift of impassibilitas, an unconquerable strength, which will mean not only freedom forever from the dominion of the passions, but also immunity from all suffering. Very daring speculation on the part of these medieval authors. The appeal made to God in the prayer is both direct and personal. Give to my body, the Dominican prays, da corpore meo. Then, after listing the four desired and amazing qualities of the resurrected body, he writes, and add to these an overflow of riches, a spate of delights, a confluence of all good things so that I may rejoice in your consolation above me, in a place of loveliness below me, in the glorification of body and soul within me, in the delight of friends and angels all around me. What an utterly simple, utterly beautiful evocation of the celestial world. world. What's unusually striking about this short prayer is that against all expectation, it's somehow able to offer a glimpse, a hint, of that untold beauty and radiance. The final image in the prayer just quoted, Thomas looking forward with hope to rejoicing in the delight of friends and angels all around him. Could that phrase, I wonder, that image, have influenced the stunning, unforgettable scene in Beato Angelico's Last Judgment painting in Florence, of the saints and angels dancing together in an open, radiant space. Sadly, all too often, I suspect, the image of heaven that's fixed in the mind of certain believers is that of a rather dull and boring eternal choir. So Angelico's truly joyous vision offers a welcome change. That vision, however, is by no means unique. On the contrary, it's a vision happily shared by many other Christian saints. Here, for example, is Saint Cyprian, describing with impressive confidence the world of joy and fellowship 
awaiting the true disciples of Jesus in the afterlife. He writes, We reckon paradise to be our home. A great throng awaits us there of those dear to us, parents, brothers, sons. A packed and numerous throng longs for us of those already free from anxiety for their own salvation who are still concerned for our salvation. What joy they share with us when we come into their sight and embrace them. What pleasure there is there in the heavenly kingdom with no fear of death and what supreme happiness with the enjoyment of eternal life. I began this paper by considering the witness of some of the early Christian martyrs. Now to conclude, I'd like to draw your attention to the witness of a young 20th century Spanish martyr, a man who has already been numbered officially among the martyrs of the church, Bartolomé Blanco Marquez. Bartolomé was 21 years old when on the 2nd of October 1936 he was executed by the communists in Spain. The day before his execution, he wrote a letter to his girlfriend, Maruja. What's immediately striking about the letter is the strength of the young man's devotion to God. Though I am in my final days, he writes, God is my light and what I long for. No less impressive in the letter is the depth of Bartolome's affection for his girlfriend. Your memory, he writes, will remain with me to the grave. Sometimes people imagine that strong devotion to God and the desire to be with God in paradise will somehow inevitably dull a person's sense of all that is good and beautiful in this world. But nothing, of course, could be further from the truth, as Bartolomé's letter to his young girlfriend so clearly testifies. Here in its entirety is the letter. Provincial Prison of Yaman, 1st of October, 1936. My dearest Maruja, your memory will remain with me to the grave, and as long as the slightest throb stirs my heart, it will beat for love of you. God has deemed fit to sublimate these worldly affections, ennobling them when we love each other in him. Though in my final days, God is my light and what I long for. This does not mean that the recollection of the one dearest to me will not accompany me until the hour of my death. I am assisted by many priests who, what a sweet comfort, pour out the treasures of grace into my soul, strengthening it. I look death in the eye and believe my words. It does not daunt me or make me afraid. My sentence before the court of mankind will be my soundest defense before God's court. In their effort to revile me, they have ennobled me. In trying to sentence me, they have absolved me. And by attempting to lose me, they have saved me. Do you see what I mean? Why, of course, because in killing me they, grant me, they grant me true life, and in condemning me for always upholding the highest ideals of religion, country, and family, they swing open before me the doors of heaven. My body will be buried in a grave in the cemetery of Yaen, while I am left with only a few hours before that definitive repose. Allow me to ask but one thing of you, that in memory of the love we shared, which at this moment is enhanced, that you would take as your primary objective the salvation of your soul. In that way we will procure a reuniting in heaven for all eternity, where nothing will separate us. Goodbye until that moment then, dearest Maruja. Do not forget that I am looking at you from heaven and try to be a model Christian woman, since in the end worldly goods and delights are of no avail if we do not manage to save our souls. My thoughts of gratitude to all your family and for you, all my love, <clears throat> sublimated in the hours of death. Do not forget me, my Maruja, and let my memory always remind you there is a better life and that attaining it should constitute our highest aspiration. Be strong and make a new life. You are young and kind and you will have God's help, which I will implore upon you from his kingdom. Goodbye until eternity then, when we shall continue to love each other for life everlasting. Clearly, there is nothing dull in Bartolomeo's vision of what awaits him in the afterlife. Yes, first and last, he will be able at last to contemplate face to face the God of light for whom he longs, but also waiting for him there, he trusts, he believes, will be his beloved Maruja, 
That thought, that implied vision of the afterlife, no doubt encourages them here and now to confront his death situation straight in the eye. His letter to Maruha is a single private communication. Nevertheless, what he makes bold to write at the point of death gives clear expression to the vision of life and death shared by each one of the saints and martyrs included so far in this brief paper. Bartolome is, we can say, speaking for all of them when, with calm faith and indomitable courage, he writes, I look death in the eye and believe my words, it does not daunt me or make me afraid. Thank you.